As William Ball revealed in his classic 1968 study of population control, the adoption of such a sweeping policy demands a method of promulgating what is no less than a new philosophy. People must be made to believe in the obligation to limit population in order to bow to the restrictions and the invasions of their privacy. To this end, as Ball points out, shortly after the U.S. government initiated its family planning program in 1965, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare issued a report calling for sex education in the schools. Although President Johnson expressly asked for a program that would only ensure that, quote, all families have access to information and services that will allow freedom to choose the number and spacing of their children within the dictates of individual conscience, end quote, the department made it clear that its sites went far beyond mere access. Young people, through federally funded sex education, must perceive their responsibilities in the area of birth control. The revelation by the department, as Ball notes, had been preceded by congressional hearings and numerous population assemblies held throughout the country to spread the message that the population crisis was of such catastrophic proportions that mere access to information would prove trivial. Speakers at the gatherings urged the need for motivation and possibly coercion. Since then, the federally funded drive for sex education to overturn the old values has, with minor setbacks, plunged ahead. In 1968, three years after the initiation of the federal family planning program, Mary Steichen Calderon, founder of the Sex Information and Education Council of the United States and former medical director of Planned Parenthood, wrote, if man as he is is obsolescent then what kind do we want to produce in his place and how do we design the production line that is the real question facing sex education she went on to stipulate that this production process would be consciously engineered by society's best minds and would provide the conditioning of attitudes and behavior as deemed desirable by, of course, the leaders of her movement. But just what attitudes and behavior would be inculcated was left somewhat vague in this article. It threw out some stock nebulous phrases the new program would eliminate fears and anxieties and develop objective and understanding attitudes toward sex so that people could utilize sexuality effectively. But Calderon was far more specific in the preface to her Manual of Family Planning and Contraceptive Practice. Family planning practice and contraceptive practice, as they are being developed, can now only be applied with total effectiveness in the service of population practice. The stark necessity emerges for a population policy explicitly developed and stated by our government and by every government on behalf of its own nation as soon as possible. Control of population growth in both developing and developed countries is crucial to socio-economic evolution and stability, and therefore to world welfare and world peace. Calderon's doleful predictions appear again in the family book about sexuality, in which she and Eric Johnson insist that, quote, if human reproduction is not soon drastically reduced, our Earth will contain more people than its space and resources can possibly support. Human fertility must somehow be reduced. If it is not, disaster is inevitable. End quote. We have adequate birth control methods, the authors say. Quote, to keep the world's birth rate, the population of the world, and the number of children in any family, community, or group within desired limits, end quote. But the problem is, quote, to get that knowledge to people who need to use these methods in such a way that they will be motivated to use them consistently, end quote. 
Other prominent sex educators, similarly obsessed with overpopulation, embrace the propaganda methods in the government sex programs. In their widely used textbook, Education for Human Sexuality, Bert and Meeks told their readers that the population explosion is the greatest problem in the world today, which, if not brought under control, will result in mass starvation by the year 2000. And, in its Implementing DHEW Policy on Family Planning, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare touted its sex education projects to reduce fertility, especially among minorities. Lester Kirkendall, one of the founders of the Sex Information and Education Council, wrote in the Humanist magazine in 1965 that, quote, Sex education is clearly tied in a socially significant way to family planning and population limitation and policy, end quote, and spoke candidly of the special treatment needed for lower class families because of their ineffective contraceptive practices. Local curriculum guides for sex education were riddled with the horrors of overpopulation. A typical program for 7th and 8th graders did a thorough job of linking its population and family planning objectives. Titled Contraception and Population Stabilization, A. The student will develop a knowledge, awareness, and understanding of the need for mature and responsible decisions regarding population stabilization through the use of contraception. 1. Discuss the effects of overpopulation, short and long range. A. Threat to life, jobs, crowded housing, lack of farmland. B. Long range, famine, and eventual death. 2. Consider future generations and need for wanted child, film and discussion. 3. Contraception. The purpose is to be able to decide the best time to have a child. A. Explain and discuss the menstrual cycle and ovulation by using charts, stress the importance of pelvic exam, breast check, and pap smear. B. Tell students resources where family planning is available. C. Discuss birth control methods, pill, IUD, diaphragm, jelly, condom, foam, douching, withdrawal, rhythm by showing a film, and showing a kit with the methods present. D. Discuss the permanent methods of birth control, vasectomy and tubal ligation. For years, leading promoters of government population control programs such as Planned Parenthood and the American Public Health Association have understood that sex education is vital to their goals. In its five-year plan for 1976 to 1980, the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, Inc. called for a, quote, zero rate of natural population increase, end quote, hand in hand with the requisite sex education to, quote, raise the level of awareness among all persons of family planning, human sexuality, population growth, and health in general, end quote. The Federation pressed its affiliates to, quote, assert leadership in developing and promoting educational programs in human sexuality in clinics, in local schools, and other organizations, end quote. In its Federation Declaration of Principles and Purposes, a planning document for 1979 to 1981, Planned Parenthood called for education and training to foster through population education initiatives the idea that there is an urgent need to slow population growth and conserve resources worldwide and that these considerations should be a part of the process of personal choice regarding one's fertility and for advocacy and public information to raise the level of awareness both at home and abroad about the magnitude of the population problem, <clears throat> the role that the United States must play in meeting it, the relationship between population growth and the role of women, 
and the need for increased support for these programs. The same proclamation was sounded in the organization's planning document Till Victory is Won, an action agenda for 1982-84. to In 1977, Planned Parenthood and other like groups joined with zero population growth to hammer out a detailed proposal for massive federal grants under the Public Health Services Act, the Social Security Act, and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act to finance, quote, fertility control, end quote. Subsequently financed by Congress, it provided for school-based education programs and training of faculty, and a spate of other educational ploys to, quote, be undertaken by health agencies, community groups, and the media, end quote. Sex education is vital to the population control programs financed by the Agency for International Development. As, for instance, the model program already mentioned that was designed for Iran and implemented by the Shah and the Ministries of Health and Education, which redesigned the school curriculum, rewrote the textbooks, and retrained thousands of teachers to emphasize population and sex education. The contract between Costa Rica and the U.S. Agency for International Development required that country to provide sex education in its schools as shown in the last chapter. The World Bank, the leading whip of government population control, understands the potential of education in instilling a modern outlook toward family planning, as does the Population Reference Bureau in describing its effectiveness throughout the world. By 1978, there were so many sex education programs for youth in developing countries that the Center for Population Options created a special clearinghouse in Washington, D.C. to keep track of them. In 1983, this agency published a list of 102 such programs, of which only 11 were operated by the governments of the countries in which they were located, suggesting, once again, the antagonism that the countries targeted by the population planners have against population control. The International Planned Parenthood Federation, the world's leading promoter of sex education, operated the largest number of programs. The insistence of the United States that sex education be made available in schools throughout the world was one of the sticking points at the UN Conference on Population and Development in Cairo in 1994. It especially aroused the ire of the Islamic countries as shown in the last chapter. Also, shortly after the conference, India, the second most populous nation on earth, quote, slammed a proposal to introduce sex education in schools, end quote, according to an Asian press report. The issue had been hotly debated across the country and much discussed in the agony columns in newspapers and magazines. Parenthetically, as it had been in the United States when the movement was gathering steam, and parenthetical, but the Education Secretary, Mr. S. V. Geary, said, quote, The academic community feels it is not advisable, end quote. This, regardless of the pressure that had been applied in Cairo and the foreign aid that would be forthcoming for it. But there was that ant that stood up to me. Yeah, but we can forget about him. Yeah, it was just one ant. <laughs> one ant. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. It's just one ant. Yeah, boss. They're puny. Hmm. Puny? Say, let's pretend this grain is a puny little ant. Did that hurt? <laughs> nope. Well, how about this one? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> how about this? You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up.